six, eight, nine, nine. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. This 1964 presidential election campaign, Daisy Spot, is the most famous political TV ad ever produced and broadcast. The TV ad ran only once. It was called Peace, Little Girl, but it made a huge impression. The 1964 presidential campaign pitted President LBJ against Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee. Fear-mongering and scare tactics are used by political campaigns as well as advertisers all the time to try and influence the opinions and actions of others towards some specific end. The feared object or subject is often exaggerated and the pattern of fear-mongering is usually one of repetition in order to continuously reinforce the intended effects of this tactic. Those same fear tactics have been used by big business and political action committees as well as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for the last 40 years to misinform and to lie to the American public on how all lawsuits hurt American businesses, harm everyday people like you and me. Their propaganda serves to rally people behind a cause, but often at the cost of exaggerating, misrepresenting, or even lying about the issues in order to gain that support. Here's a prime example of their outright lies in a TV ad sponsored by the Florida Chamber of Commerce, attacking the very lawyers who fight to protect Americans' rights. You save each year for important things like retirement, college, but you probably didn't know that lawsuits are forcing your family to pay $3,400 more each year for everyday goods and services. Some trial lawyers are exploiting our courts using frivolous lawsuits to make millions. Every family pays the price. Some would say it's almost criminal. Urge your senator to support reforms. Sponsored by the Florida Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Institute for Legal Reform. Only thing is, the ad is not true. It's just more big business propaganda that serves to rally people behind a cause, and often at the cost of exaggerating, misrepresenting, or even lying about the issues in order to gain that support. You see, fear sells, and all political campaigns and advertisers use it. Fear advertising is often referred to as shock advertising, and it's very popular because fear is a very strong emotion, and it can be manipulated to steer people into making emotional rather than reasoned choices. Tom Donahue, president and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and a champion of fear advertising, represents the vast majority of America's biggest corporation. He regularly spouts off the usual complaints of how corporations are burdened by important public protections needed to hold corporations accountable for wrongdoing, such as access to the civil justice system. One example of such burdens, according to the U.S. Chamber and its so-called Institute for Legal Reform, is an individual's right to turn to the court system when they suffer losses at the hands of big business. It's called the Seventh Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Chamber has continuously sought to restrict consumers' rights to go to court. Individuals already face numerous and unreasonable obstacles to access the courts but the industry still wants more, and it is seeking to combat any potential advances that would restore some of our rights as consumers in the marketplace. One such advance, which the U.S. Chamber and its financial industry friends are fanatical about, are some recent developments at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The CFPB is in the midst of studying one of the industry's most forceful tools to restrict consumer rights, the use of forced arbitration, and bans on class action in financial services contracts. Arbitration classes are the terms in corporate contracts that eliminate the right of customers and employees to a jury trial. 
and direct individuals to resolve disputes with industry in a secret proceeding called arbitration. Most of these clauses also forbid participation in class actions. That means that consumer claims against companies must be arbitrated on an individual basis, a method that is often impractical for consumers to pursue. As a result, consumers are unable to have their day in court when harmed. And if they can't seek redress, the result is that companies rarely have to answer for predatory or even illegal practices. In this insider exclusive investigative network TV show, our news team presents Restoring American Justice, Know Your Rights, featuring Yaida Ford, managing principal of the Ford Law Firm, who works tirelessly to help ordinary people navigate a very complex legal system to get justice as they face extreme life-altering adversities. It also shows how the government and big business with their million dollar PR campaigns are slowly eroding our rights to seek justice and making an end run around the civil justice system. Yaida shares case examples from her extensive legal career that Americans need to know more about, which offer insightful viewpoints of the problems in our judicial system, as well as recommended necessary remedies. This new network TV special educates everyone on how their rights have been threatened and allows us to learn more about the actions of corporations, insurance companies, and others that continue to negatively impact the rights of citizens throughout the country and are focused on denying justice for individuals. In terms of our democracy, the stakes could not be higher. The courts are the first and last resort for protecting constitutional rights of Americans. Wealthy corporate interests scheme every day to undermine civil justice. They seek to restrict trial by jury, limit damages through caps, and exploit anything that keeps them unaccountable. Some of the important issues we address are access to justice, access to justice regarding federal rules change, consumer protection, the need for new legislation to put public safety over corporate interest, equal pay for equal work, mandatory arbitration, federal preemption and preserving state consumer laws, patient safety and medical liability, whistleblower protections, and raising awareness to protect the elderly. When Americans' access to justice is denied, unscrupulous insurance companies, Wall Street banks, reckless drivers, dangerous hospitals, and other wrongdoers can get away with the worst we must act to make sure they clean up their acts. Yaida's firm's goals are not only to get justice for her clients, but to make sure that everyone is treated with equal respect and dignity as guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. Yaida has built a substantial reputation by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. Her amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide her clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Washington, D.C. It is my great pleasure to introduce you. Aida Ford to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about your law firm. What kind of law do you practice? I specialize in condominium law, estate planning, and I have a civil rights practice. Okay. And you do some employment law too, don't you? That's, yes, a part of the civil rights, yes. All right. Um, you represent, when you do employment law, and you, when you do um, cases that involve civil rights individuals, right? Why do you choose to represent individuals in these cases? Because it's very difficult for plaintiffs yeah. um, to achieve justice in, in, in the employment context. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a very s steep burden of proof. Um, and um, quite frankly, uh, the law school that I went to, I went to Howard University School of Law. And my, so I have a, a, a certain bent towards civil rights cases. Yeah. And uh, we carefully screen them, but they're definitely worth taking. And, and some people deserve to be sued. Right. And, and that's just, 
the, you know, how it is. Some people deserve to be sued, mm -hmm. and, and plaintiffs won't uh, achieve justice on their own. It's very hard to do an employment case without a lawyer, yes. and it's, it's uh, very hard to do it without a good lawyer. Over the last 30 years, laws have been gradually changing, and this show is about restoring what people perceive as they're taught in school, American justice, justice for all, right? Fast, good justice that's, that, that signifies equality. Um, over the last, as long as you've been practicing the 10 years, you've seen some changes that kind of don't go in that direction, do they? They have made it harder to get justice for clients in the judicial system, correct? Yes. Can you give some examples, like for example, with the issue of access to justice, the ability for one to access the court system when it comes to some of the practices that you are involved with, like the homeowners associations, civil rights, et cetera? I think uh, one of the common issues all across the board uh, that I see in my practice uh, is the heavy docket. When courts are, are burdened with a lot of cases, it, it takes a long time yeah. for a plaintiff to see resolution. So, uh, for example, in any given case, it can take over a year, maybe even two years to e get a trial. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, because we live in a very litigious society and people are going to court more, uh, it, it's very hard for plaintiffs uh, that have legitimate cases. And, and it's not to um, dismiss people who file, but a lot of cases get kicked out for being frivolous. And so, for the, the clients who have legitimate claims and have legal representation, it, it's almost like you can't navigate the justice system yes. with unless you can afford an attorney and that makes it very hard for people that have meritorious cases yeah. but just don't have the money there are some court systems in america today i think one's in tyson corner another one's in tyler texas which are commonly known as the rocket docket in these particular court systems cases get hurt a lot faster etc why are they able to do it in their court systems and not all around America? And why doesn't the rest of America implement what they're doing in their system? Well, the rest of America should. The federal courts are electronic, and so it's easier to litigate there. Yeah. Uh, but however, in state courts, they're, they're not. Uh, D.C., however, mm -hmm. is electronic, and yeah. it's all the branches are slowly moving to that direction. Maryland is just going to get its first uh, county that's going to become electronic. Yeah. And when, but when I say electronic, you can file complaints electronically. You can file all your motions. Yeah. The judges can issue their orders electronically. So it just makes it a lot easier yeah. uh, on, on the parties and on the judges. However, I know I can speak in D.C. at least, you can't file electronically in, unless you have counsel. So it's harder for a litigant that doesn't have an attorney who doesn't know anything yeah. uh, about computers. It, it's, that still presents a challenge for them. Yeah, one of your areas that you practice a lot is homeowners associations. You represent the associations and individuals, don't you? Yes, I do. How have you seen the law change so that it's more difficult to get justice? And what do you recommend that how things should change so it would be easier? Well, you know, I can speak for uh, D.C. in particular. I think that it's been very difficult in the District of Columbia for homeowners associations, with especially with the turn of the, the economy, um, because one of the issues that they have commonly is that when owners stop paying condo fees, uh, the associations uh, can't remain viable, and by that I mean they can't pay their common expenses, the, the water, the lights, the gas. Uh, some associations have gone into receivership because of that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, when it becomes hard for an association to collect from an owner, uh, it, it's, it's hard on everybody who lives in that community. And with a lot of foreclosures going on, you know, associations are dealing with a lot of abandoned units. And so the issue has been, legally for the association, has been how do we go after the owners who have, have abandoned their units and, and get what's due us mm -hmm. and and then you know we have to deal with the bank the law in DC has, has recently changed to give HOAs a, a little more certainty in collecting uh, some of those dues when an owner leaves and they there's now this bank that's that owns this property yeah. but it, how does the HOA get the bank to pay the condo fees so now at least um, if for example, an uh, HOA decides that it wants to foreclose on a unit uh, and take the unit to auction. So uh, uh, the, the bank, um, if the bank doesn't step up to pay some of those condo fees, uh, whoever gets it at the auction gets it free and clear of a mortgage. And so that makes it somewhat easier for the associations to, to stay viable and, and get some uh, income from the bank. Mm -hmm. 
What about in the employment area? Because you do handle employment discrimination cases, that sort of thing, correct? Um, how have you seen the law change negatively, let's say, against individuals? And what do you recommend that it should be remedied? Give an example, mandatory arbitration. Taking people's ability to file suit uh, against their employer, against somebody, because they've signed an arbitration agreement, they've signed in their contract, their employment agreement or whatever. Hmm. Well, in the arbitration context, sometimes you can get around that. Yeah. Um, you know, employers generally don't like to be sued because it goes public. Yeah. Okay, so it, it, sometimes, what, what a plaintiff, what I've done in some of my cases is, you know, we threaten to file suit anyway, and then if they want to move to dismiss based on the arbitration clause, then fine. But I now have gone around, you know, that arbitration clause. I filed suit anyway so that it becomes public, yeah. so that other employees know about it. Because what employers don't want is they don't want all, especially these large Fortune 500 yeah. companies or larger companies, they don't want other employees to step up and start suing, especially if it is a, a wage violation where they're not paying overtime right. out. Usually that's affecting more than one employee. If it's discrimination and it's dealing with a particular class, maybe it's African-American employees yeah. or maybe it's women, uh, employers don't want that stuff to go public. So I've gotten around the arbitration uh, clause, if the client has signed that, I've gotten around that by f threatening to file anyway, um, and you know, occasionally having done that, and then if they move to dismiss, well, it's still public. And uh, occasionally we'll also um, find other plaintiffs and let them know this is what's going on mm -hmm. to kind of force the employers uh, to, to give justice to the clients earlier without having to go to court. Okay, let's talk about civil rights. Civil rights, and as you had mentioned before, the obliteration of civil rights, um, people's ability who have been harmed by the government, police, whatever, to uh, seek redress in court is becoming much more difficult, isn't it? Okay, how has that happened? And how do you see changing it to make it a better place for citizens who have been harmed to get justice? I think the, the first thing um, that makes it difficult for plaintiffs is lack of knowledge. Um, when, this, when, when an injury happens or an injury is inflicted uh, on a citizen by an officer, people don't really know about the, for example, the, statu the, the statute of limitations or some jurisdictions have notice requirements where you have to notify a certain part of the state or a certain entity uh, to let them know that you're going to bring suit. Uh, and people just aren't educated and, or informed about the laws. Yeah. So that makes it very difficult on the one hand. For, for people who do get an attorney uh, and, and go to court, you know, it's an uphill battle in, in civil rights cases. Uh, we talked about the motion to bifurcate or motions to bifurcate, and these are done routinely in civil rights cases. And really, they're really reserved for personal injury uh, cases or regular tort cases to separate issues of liability from damages. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing um, now, and we've seen it really in the last 20 years, is that uh, counties, when they're sued, will file these motions to bifurcate uh, to separate the uh, liability of the individual officers mm -hmm. from the liability of the county. And, and that makes it hard because then you yeah. potentially have two trials. Right. You've potentially got two periods of discovery and most plaintiffs just don't, don't last that long. Yeah, and not only that, but the lawyer that's representing these plaintiffs. It's on an extraordinary a expense. Yeah. It's an extraordinary on a contingency expense. contingency That's basis. right. That's you don't right. have to foot the bill. A absolutely. Right? And, if, and then, after the second trial, if there is one, if they appeal it, right. they, they just, you don't get the funds right away, so the clients don't get the resolution right away. It just amazes me why they want to bifurcate trials like that, because, oh, I mean, and I, do. Understand <laughs> and the they purpose. Do. I understand the purpose, but it amazes me, it should be determined right away whether this person was acting within the employment of their employer, correct? And if that was determined, then they all, you know, it's all heard at once because that would be the fairer thing. And that's what this show is all about. That's right. How can, how can justice be fairer? You have a lot of complications, a lot of procedural complications, correct? Yes, and I'm trying to say this without being insulting to the judicial system, that yeah, I, I'm an officer insulting. of the court. You know, this, is, this is your insight, your insightful view of what you see, how the justice system, wheels of justice turn you know, slowly. In, in our judicial system, yeah. uh, um, Judges interpret laws, okay, yeah. and they interpret laws 
based on their understanding. And it's not always an understanding that we agree with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously, as lawyers, we have the recourse, we can file an appeal, um, but it, it makes it difficult when, uh, you know, judges are interpreting uh, laws in a way that are consistently um, adverse to the plaintiff. And again, we see this a lot in 1983 cases with the motions to bifurcate mm -hmm. and the interpretation of a, a case um, called the City of Los Angeles versus Heller, you know, where the, there's this notion that you can't hold a, a city liable if, you know, the officers are not held liable. And that's yeah. just not, that's not. So the that's a Los Angeles case? That is a Los Angeles case. Oh, interesting. You know, I was looking to see where that came from, and I didn't see it in City this City of Los area. Angeles versus Heller. Interesting. Um, let's say you had the ability to improve the legal system. Hmm. Okay. What would you recommend? What would be your top five or top three things that you would want to see done? Uh, I think the first thing is uh, making the courts more accessible uh, for people who can't necessarily afford counsel. Uh, the second thing is um, definitely encouraging uh, electronic filing all across the board. It, it really helps um, expedite a resolution um, of cases. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I think dealing with perception, I think in our, our judicial system, and then it's natural for humans, but there is a bias towards certain plaintiffs. I think plaintiffs that are low income, yeah. uh, plaintiffs that um, English is not their primary language. Right. Uh, there's a, a natural bias there. And so I, I think somehow leveling that playing field so that people are ensured that when they get a jury trial or they get a bench trial with a judge, that it's going to be fair and it's going to yeah. be impartial. You get a lot of calls to your office from people who need your help. You'd like to help everybody, I'm sure. But there aren't enough hours in the day you know, and so my question to you, and this is the last question on this show, is how do you select your clients and the cases that you get involved with? Well, Steve, I, I have a boutique law firm and I, I, I pride myself on choosing a few areas uh, to specialize in and that way I can become an expert in those things. Yeah. Um, but it makes it hard, like you said, because there's so many people who need help um, and who have good cases and we just can't help everybody. So the first thing that we look at, it, it, me and my staff, is we, we examine the facts of the case. How egregious is the harm? to the particular individual. The other thing is what is our capacity to serve this person? Can we serve them effectively? If we think we're too busy at that time, we'll refer them to other counsel. So that, which leads to my third point, we keep relationships with other lawyers who are good at what they do. Um, and if we can't help that person, then we refer them out or we co-counsel frequently uh, with other attorneys. But it's, it's definitely difficult because you have so many people who've been harmed. Um, and, and so we have a screening process that we use in those cases that, um, reflect my values as a lawyer, um, reflect societal ills that I think need to be changed, mm -hmm. those are the ones that we take. Mm -hmm. What do you do with a case where you really feel for the individual, they've really been harmed, but you know that they probably, there's a very slim chance they'll win. What do you do with those cases? Sometimes we take them. I mean, yeah. it really just depends. I mean, there's a fine line uh, between uh, compassion and stupidity, but yeah. we do, sometimes we challenge ourselves with those cases. Yeah. I mean, just because it's difficult doesn't mean that you can't win, yeah. but we've definitely done that when we feel that it, it is worth uh, the service to the client and mm -hmm. when we think that it's a risk that we want to share with that client. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much for being on this show. Uh, you've shared a lot of your wisdom from your own insight and uh, everybody appreciates it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.